A few years ago, when my daughter was a toddler, my wife and I used to take her to a nearby lake to picnic, swim, and just unwind. It was a peaceful spot, quiet, not too crowded, the kind of place where you could easily forget about the world for a while. One afternoon, after we finished eating, my wife decided to go for a quick swim while I stayed on the beach with our daughter. I watched her wade out into the water, the sun sparkling off the surface. A minute later, she suddenly stopped and turned to me, shouting something. At first, I couldn't make out what she said, but her expression was off. Then I heard her clearly. I think I just stepped on someone's face. I froze for a second, thinking maybe she was just joking, but the look on her face wasn't playful. It was pale, almost terrified. She quickly started making her way back to the shore, her legs moving faster like she couldn't get out of the water fast enough. When she got back to me, she was visibly shaken. She said that while she was swimming, her foot brushed against something soft. At first, she thought it was a rock or a weird patch of seaweed. But when she pressed her foot down, she felt the unmistakable shape of a face beneath the water, a nose and an eye socket. She swore she felt the hollow of an eye. I considered going in to check it out, but something stopped me. The unease in my gut, maybe. We decided to pack up and leave right after that. The next day, the local news reported that a young boy who had been missing for days was found drowned in that same lake, not far from where we had been. He'd been there the whole time, just beneath the surface. To this day, my wife is convinced she stepped on his face. I'm a police officer in the southern U.S. in a suburban department of about a hundred sworn officers. I work in a college town. I've been on about 10 years now, made sergeant four years ago. But at the time of this story, I was just two years on working night shift patrol. I've been lucky that not a lot has affected me mentally. Anyway, during my career, I didn't have kids. That's how it usually gets to you. You can build all the mental walls you want, but when you have an emotional connection with your kids and see something happening to kids, the walls mean nothing. Anyway, this one stuck with me. Still makes the hair stand on end, especially when it rains. It was September, just after midnight. I get put on a call of shots fired. Now normally, these calls turn out to be either fireworks or perhaps a car backfiring but mostly fireworks. So unless we get multiple calls on it, or a confirmed gunman, or someone confirmed wounded, we just send one unit. That night, it was me. The shots fired was reported around a college football stadium. This was during football season, so there were a bunch of really big white tents set up all around the parking lot for tailgaters. I notified dispatch that I was on the scene and started rolling through the parking lots, casting my spotlight here and there. It was raining pretty heavily and hard to see. About halfway through the lot, my spotlight illuminated a silhouette of a man sitting in a folded chair. Under one of those big tents, I pulled closer and lit him up and notified dispatch that I was out with one in the parking lot. His back was to me. He appeared to be hunched forward as if his elbows were on his knees and his head leaning forward. I walked towards him and started calling out to him. Can't remember exactly what I said, but something like, hey man, you okay? You heard anything strange? Can you come talk to me? He didn't move or answer. As I drew closer, I lit him up with my flashlight. I then noticed the outline of a shotgun on the pavement next to him. Combined with him not answering and the nature of the call, It was enough for me to break leather and have dispatch hold the channel. I kept calling him as I approached, asking him to show me his hands, 30 feet, 20 feet, 10 feet. I close on him, come around to the front of him. That's when I notice this guy succeeded in taking his life with the shotgun. He blew his head clean off. You do this job long enough, 
and you notice funny little details. His elbow were indeed resting on his knees. It was as though he blew his head off, set the shotgun down on the ground next to him, and leaned forward and rested his elbows on his knees to think about what he'd done. About that time, I noticed even though I was under the tent with him, it felt like it was raining. And then I looked up. One of the creepiest stories I know personally is from my best friend. When he was at home at his house babysitting a friend's kid, the kid's name, who was Junior, was roughly four to five. His dad was a courier, so would often be doing long deliveries late at night. David, my best friend, was a teen by this point, so being home without an adult was no great task. It's important to mention that his father was a pretty paranoid individual who bought into a lot of fear mongering in the world. So he had cameras set up all over the place. I want to say this happened in 2014. Anyway, David was busy in his bedroom and was minding his own business, but then decided to head into his den where all the cameras happened to be set up. But the den was locked. David knocked on the door to the den and Junior opened it up. Why did you lock the door? David said. Because of the lady, Junior said. What lady? David asked. Your mom, I saw her in the kitchen. The house's living room was directly connected to the kitchen, and if you were standing in the kitchen entryway, you could see the door leading outside. It was one of those screened-in sitting areas. Junior claimed that David's mother was right there in the doorway. Really strange, especially considering David's mother had passed away just about eight months prior. David was chilled by the remark. But the skeptic in him knew it was likely just Junior's overly active imagination. So he agreed to go and check it with him. He brought the kitchen knife, if I'm remembering the story correctly. He walked with Junior down the hallway into the kitchen, where the door was open. The door being open was pretty normal. It was a hot summer day, and the house trapped a lot of heat. David stepped out into the screen sitting area, and looked left down the ramp his mother used to use, to get outside. Nothing. He looked to the right, seeing the length of the yard. Nothing. Junior was insistent that there was someone there, which is strange considering usually in situations like these, kids tend to feel better after you poke around for them. David couldn't calm him down though. Junior was certain. He kept saying, I saw your mom. She was there. So David bargained with him. Everything's recorded on the cameras so we'll just look them over and we'll know for sure whether someone was there or not. So they sifted through the cameras and David looked for the timestamp around when Junior claimed that his deceased mother had shown up. He stared down all the cameras as the timer ticked on and nothing showed up. But suddenly, he watched as a camera showed a figure enter his backyard from the front by pulling the latch. An old woman, at least in her mid-sixties, confidently walked into their backyard. She had a cloth grocery bag in her hand. She headed up the ramp and stood in the screened sitting area for a few moments. She then reached for the door to the kitchen, cracking it open, then she brazenly stepped inside. After some time, Junior saw her in the kitchen and headed to David to tell him. Based on the camera's timestamps, she stood in the kitchen for at least 10 minutes. The absolutely insane part is she left as David went to investigate with Junior. The camera footage showed him looking around and her leaving as he looked around. When he looked left down the ramp, where she'd come up, she had already wrapped around and actually took the long way around through the length of the yard. When he looked right, he quite literally just missed her. It was genuinely a matter of half a second. Someone wandered right into his backyard and right into his kitchen and stood there for 10 minutes in his kitchen doing God knows what. Nothing was stolen, or nobody was harmed. Well, anyway, the night went on, and nothing came of it. Me personally, I would have phoned the police, but David wouldn't. I think there was a chance that his dad may have had some guns that were acquired through perhaps some non-reputable methods. They were locked away from everyone. So David's instinct was that his dad would likely be furious about the police being called. Some time passed, 
days, weeks, who knows? I'm not even sure about how this information came about, but somehow David was told by either a family member or a staff member that the old woman that wandered into his house had dementia and had an episode and just sort of found herself there by a string of coincidences. When I was a child, I had a friend named Lucy. She was a neighborhood girl who would come over to my grandmother's house, which was where I lived at the time. There was a park by my house that had a deep creek next to it. I couldn't swim, so we always had to have an adult with us when we were near the creek. Lucy was a toxic friend, but I didn't know. She would always threaten to stop being friends with me or stop talking to me if I didn't do what she wanted. She would always say that she deserved my toys, my family, and my friends more than I did. I didn't mind this. I had a hard time making friends, and Lucy was one of my only friends. One night, Lucy came over, and she told me she was bored, and she wanted to go to the park. I told her my family was in the backyard, and we'd have to have an adult go with us. But she said she would leave and never come back if I didn't go to the park with her. I followed her, and we went to the park. She walked right past the playground equipment to the creek, and I asked her what she was doing. She said she wanted to swim, and I told her I couldn't swim, and she called me a string full of hurtful names, including weak, stupid, and an awful friend. This really hurt my five-year-old self-esteem, so I started crying. This made her even angrier, and she told me something I'll never forget. You're an awful child. Your family deserved me and not you. I was so confused and sad that I just ran home. I never saw her again, and I just thought she was so angry, she really never spoke to me again. Now, about a year ago, my family was talking about my imaginary friends, and my mom said my friend Lucy really creeped her out because she was supposed to have a daughter before me that wanted to have the name Lucy. My mother had a miscarriage, and Lucy was never born. I once held a hunting lease in middle Georgia. It was an abandoned hunting camp that hadn't been used in several years. I'm not superstitious at all, but this place was legitimately spooky. It was miles down an overgrown dirt road and completely surrounded by woods. It was probably the most secluded place I've ever been. I used to hunt there by myself a lot, and there's always this weird sense that I wasn't alone out there. There was a locked gate at the front of the property, but it was not uncommon for us to find the front door of the cabin open, even when the door was locked. That was pretty creepy, but that's not what the story is about. One evening, I was hunting down in a small valley by a food plot we put lighting a creek that bordered the property. From the minute I sat down, I had a weird feeling, like I wasn't in a safe place even though I was holding a 308 with ballistic tipped rounds. I didn't feel like I was the top predator out there. I didn't see any deer while I was sitting in the stand, but the forest was abuzz with activity. Birds, squirrels, and other critters singing their normal evening symphony, and then all of a sudden, silence. Everything just stopped. It felt like everything in the woods were looking right at me. It was getting dark fast, and I was extremely creeped out so I packed up my gear and started back to the cabin. About a hundred yards away, I had this feeling that something was coming up behind me. I had spun around and pointed my rifle back down the path towards the food plot, and then I saw it. There was something standing there in the middle of the path. It wasn't a person, but it didn't look like a deer or anything I've seen before. There was hardly any light to make out any features, but it almost looked like some kind of bipedal deer or something. It was just standing there, staring at me. I quickly made my way back to the cabin, packed up my stuff, and got out of there. I just let the lease run out, never went back after that.